Okay, um, well, hello. Um, my name's Allie, and thank you for clicking on my video because this is my first one, so you have absolutely no precedent or reason to do that. So thank you for being here. Welcome to my library, I guess. I feel like I'm supposed to be sitting in front of a rainbow wall of yarn, but I don't collect yarn the way that I collect books, <laughs> though. Actually, I think that's not really an accurate comparison because yarn is like, you know, in the unused state, right? Yarn is like before it becomes a finished object. These are not unused. These are books that I have read. I read all of these. In that way, the knitting equivalent of this would be like if this was all finished objects, which I started knitting two years ago. There's simply not been the time. Like maybe come back in 70 years and maybe 100 year old me will have an entire library's worth of finished garments, but today is not that day. So for a little bit of context, I'm coming to you from just outside Toronto in Canada. It is very cold here right now. It is like, feels like minus 20 with the wind chill, which that's Celsius by the way. And I live here with my dog Copper, who you will probably hear once in a while because he's an opinionated creature and he will let you know about those opinions. I am also coming to you with the tea. I feel like that's gonna be a staple of the channel. So we might as well introduce it now. Um, also this mug, by the way, can we just have a moment? This is um, handmade ceramic by um, my friend Jessica Bromley Bartram, who I went to OCAD with and she makes these amazing mugs and it's just beautiful and I feel like it deserves a moment. Um, and in it today I'm drinking um, Sloan Classic Earl Grey, which is my all-time favorite tea and Sloan is actually a Canadian tea brand, so that's fun. So I've been watching knitting podcasts for about a year now. Um, I've been knitting for almost exactly two years. I started in February of 2022, um, but I've only been watching knitting podcasts for a year. And I didn't really have it in the back of my head that I was going to start a knitting podcast. But on the other hand, like I did about a decade ago, I'm, I'm 30. So when I was in university, I like briefly had a YouTube channel kind of in the era of like sit down vlog, just like talk about stuff, try to be vaguely funny. It was basically a project that I started in the summer in university, which is like four months long. It's quite a lot of time. And then the school semester started again. <laughs> and... I did not have the time. Um, so I guess like, like part of my brain just likes making videos. I really like video editing. Um, I'm also, I'm a graphic designer um, professionally. So I do just like doing creative things. I like making things really, um, which also makes a lot of sense why I like knitting. So I've been watching a lot of knitting podcasts over the last year or so. Um, I found when I started knitting, I suddenly needed a lot more content because I like to watch things when I knit and before that I wasn't watching a ton of stuff. You know, I, I watched YouTube, I had my usual subscription list, but it didn't add up to the number of hours that I was spending knitting and so suddenly I needed more stuff to watch and so I was finding myself more, um, more receptive to YouTube's like homepage suggestions than I historically had been and that like really quickly spiraled into a lot of knitting podcasts. Um, and then the other day I was watching um, Knits by Mandy's video where she talks about the money that her channel made in 2023 and <laughs> what a terrible inciting incident that sounds like for this channel because it's like oh I found out you can make money and now I'm making videos. No, it was just the, I don't know, something about her talking about um, just like the process of starting her channel and how it kind of progressed over time. Just the behind the scenes of it really just kind of got gears turning. Hello. Yep. Do you want to say hi? Wave. Wave. <laughs> this is Copper. He's a mini Australian Shepherd. And what else would you like to say? Oh, you got your breakfast all over your neck. That's really nice. You're looking real good, dude. So I was watching this video from Knits by Mandy and it just really got gears turning in my head where I was suddenly like, what if I had a knitting podcast? And I don't know. I, I really like documenting my knits. I am pretty thorough on Ravelry as it is. Um, but I also know I do really like video editing. I do, part of me has sort of toyed with the idea of restarting a YouTube channel, like not specifically a knitting one for years and years. And it just never, it just never quite like made it to the top of the priority list. I have a lot of other things that I like to do and there is just only so much time, but I feel like the idea of a knitting podcast has really bumped it up the list for me in part because knitting has just become a really big priority for me and in part because Knitting is an expensive hobby and <laughs> I think that it might actually benefit from having 
something that feels like part of knitting um, that doesn't use yarn. <laughs> so actually I anticipate that this channel might slow down my knitting a little, which um, would be helpful in a certain way, um, but still feel like I am knitting, like still feel like it's part of it, um, which is also gonna make it sound like I knit really quickly, which I don't think is the case, or at least not the case relative to other knitting podcasts, because I see some of the, like, what I knit this year's, and I'm like, <laughs> how? When? I just, some of you have, like, four children. I just don't, <laughs> I just don't know how you do it. It is wildly impressive. I am not that. But I do like expensive yarn. <laughs> This is, this is a struggle because, so I find, I'm a person who is just always cold. Um, I just, I am cold blooded. I don't know. It just, it, it's a thing. It's been a thing my whole life. And I discovered a few years ago that wool is magic. Wool is the only thing that I can wear that I do not get cold in. And if I already have a chill because I've not been wearing wool and I just feel freezing and like nothing I put on is helping, wool is always the thing that helps. So I really love knitting out of pure wool, and I also really value wool that's traceable to know what the treatment of the sheep was like. So that just adds up to like, not sheep yarn. <laughs> Which means that even when I knit an amount that is perhaps humble by the standards of most knitting podcasts, it still gets pricey. Um, and so <laughs> I feel like that's something that a knitting podcast could to alleviate a little by extending the hobby in a way that doesn't cost me more yarn. Um, and related to that, one thing that I really would like to do with this channel is talk more about the finances of it. And that's partly inspired by a couple of knitting podcasts that I already watch. Um, String Things by Mel and aka Nora Knits both talk quite openly about the exact amount of money that they spend on each of their knitting projects. And I really appreciate that. I feel like that's really helpful for people to know. Um, especially for people who are watching knitting podcasts who aren't like super actively knitting yet, but would like to just to have an idea of like when we're talking about different kinds of yarn, what that actually adds up to and how much money you can either save or spend depending on what you choose and depending on the types of patterns that you choose. Um, I feel like financial transparency is really valuable in general and I would like to apply that here too. Um, so that's something that I think whenever I talk about a finished project, I want to talk about exactly what it costs me. I wish that I could show you how very makeshift this setup is right now because initially I thought originally that I was going to film this on the DSLR camera that I have. Um, in part because when I did YouTube videos in a past life, I used that camera. But again, this was in the like 2011 era of YouTube where videos were, you would sit here and you would talk. And the fact that my camera didn't have an autofocus in video mode wasn't really a problem because I wasn't really moving. And then I was in the process of setting the camera up and I was trying to do some test shots and I was like, wait a minute. Like, <laughs> as soon as I like hold up a ball of yarn, <laughs> I think we're going to have a problem. I think, I think like 98% of this video is going to end up out of focus if I try to record a knitting podcast with no autofocus because there's so much like moving around and like showing things and holding things up. So we're recording this on an iPhone from 2020, so shout out to the iPhone 11 Pro. We'll see how you do. I have my laptop over here screen mirrored from my phone so that I can see what my phone is recording because I'm using the back camera on my phone because it has the better camera. The phone is sitting on top of an upside down plant pot, which itself is sitting on top of a piano. <laughs> so we're just, we're making it work with what we've got. Okay, so to start this off like a real knitting podcast, because apparently we are one of those now, um, let's talk about what I'm wearing. So this is a knit that I finished in September. This is the Barnsley sweater by Cheryl Mokhtari. And it is just like the coziest. It's a, it's a um, raglan waffle knit pullover. Um, I knit it out of the Knitting for Olive merino and silk mohair in the color unicorn purple. And it is just... Oh, it's just so good. Like I, this I think is my favorite sweater that I've knit to wear. Um, it's a DK weight. So it's this really like wearable weight <laughs> in a way where a lot of my earlier knits, I think like a lot of people are on the bulkier end of things, which is so nice for learning and so satisfying. They work up so quickly, but just 
the reality is that it can just be hard to find days where you can actually wear them without sweating to death. So this was my first DK weight knit. So it felt like it took forever, <laughs> but now I'm so glad that I have it because it is really the most versatile and I absolutely love the color, which I'm really relieved about because this color was a real departure for me. It's not that I don't knit in color. I have quite a lot of color in my knits, but they tend to be like warmer in color, like kind of warmer dipper, dipper richer and deeper is what that was supposed to be. Not these sort of like light springy colors like this lilac, but I mean, lilac has obviously been having a moment for the last couple of years and it really, really won me over. Um, and I was worried that I wasn't gonna like wearing it, like that I would like it as an object, but that I wouldn't reach for it because I wouldn't like how it looked on me, but I actually love this sweater and I feel really good in it. So welcome to my Barnsley sweater. Um, I'll talk about it more in my everything I knit this year video. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed knitting this one. This was great. I found the pattern really simple and easy to follow. It was really easy to memorize the repeat for the waffle knit. Um, the only thing is that this pattern is not great on the size inclusivity front. So when you subtract the intended positive ease from the largest finished bust measurement, you end up with a largest bust size that it's designed to accommodate of about 48 inches, which isn't very big. So honestly, I have to do the pattern like a D for size inclusivity. And that's something that has sort of only more recently ended up on my radar, um, but it's something that I want to start paying more attention to. So not the best in that respect. I would say I feel like this pattern is simple enough that I think that you could probably upsize it just by increasing your gauge without throwing anything wildly off. Like it's just a very simple raglan. Um, so I do think that could be an option but obviously that's not a thing one should have to do to be able to knit a sweater in a size that will fit them. So definitely some pros and cons to this design. I have a finished object to show you. I mean, really, I really I could show you a lot of finished objects um, because I've never shown you any, but um, I think my next video is actually going to be like an everything I've ever knit. So today I'm just gonna show you my most recent finished object. So you're actually going to be able to tell that I've worn this finished object quite a bit already <laughs> because um, they're, they're kind of fuzzy you can you can kind of see that they have gotten some use <laughs> so these are my um reading socks basically um i if you are in canada like me you know what indigo is if you're not indigo is basically our barnes and noble it's like our big box bookstore um but basically their tactic to like survive the advent of amazon is to pivot such that about like half the store is now like lifestyle and homewaresy stuff um which you know what you gotta do what you gotta do and their stuff is really nice like I <laughs> when I first started making this pivot I was like you're supposed to be a bookstore and then I was like oh but I actually like everything you have so it's okay but anyway so they sell what they call reading socks which are basically these like really big chunky like slipper socks essentially and over the last few years since they've started having these I have just like worn these to absolute death like I have had several pairs and I have worn enormous holes into the bottom of every single one of them. <laughs> so I was interested in the idea of knitting my own. Um, and yes, so I was interested in the idea of knitting my own and I went diving in Ravelry to try to find the perfect pattern. Um, one thing that I should probably address off the bat is that I am incredibly picky in like all... <laughs> all respects to like personal style and personal taste so when I say I went digging in Ravelry like I think I looked at like every single pattern that could remotely be considered a reading sock even if you had to like increase the gauge of the sock because it was just supposed to be like kind of a chunky regular sock but oh maybe if I knit it with bigger yarn it could be like a reading sock I I went deep and the pattern that I found has the world's worst title, but it is by Drops Design. Um, so it's a free pattern, which is really nice, um, but it is the 116-28 Socks with Cables. What a great name. Um, but it was a pretty good pattern. I didn't have any issues knitting it. Um, I am quite happy with how they turned out. And I also, is the bottom of my sock super dirty? Am I gonna regret showing this to you? I added um, little rubber stops at the bottom because um, I had knit one pair of socks for myself before. I've knit a couple others for other people, but so the one that I knit for myself, I, I wore them a lot. Again, I really like wool. So when I suddenly had a pair of wool socks, I was wearing them a lot and I really quickly got a hole in the bottom and I was like, this was too much work <laughs> for there to already be a hole in the bottom. 
and yes I can darn them and I will but um I haven't <laughs> it's probably been like a year and I just it just hasn't it's on my to-do list and it just somehow never quite makes it to the top so anyway when I was making these knitting socks I mean knitting socks reading socks but to be honest I do read them a lot while knitting so maybe they're also knitting socks but I, I got this when I was ordering some yarn for another project um I thought that I would maybe try adding some of this sock stop to the socks to see if it would extend the lifespan of these socks. Um, so I'm hopeful that with the help of that, these won't wear through quite as quickly. It's also much thicker yarn, but you know. Um, so basically what you do is just after you've blocked it, you just like dab on it. It's like, like fabric paint or something. You just like glob it on and then it takes like eight hours to dry. And then you have these little rubber bits. Now, some of them have come off and this this is the thing that I could very much do better next time because the first time I was putting it on I just didn't really like know what it was going to be like and um this is a, a single ply yarn and like a really thick single ply yarn actually let me show you what it looks like so this is the we are knitters the wool so single ply very very thick I think it's actually like thicker than a bulky weight like it's very bulky um so of course it has quite a like halo on it. So when I was trying to glob this on, there were times where like, if I looked at it from the side, I'm like, you're not even like really touching the yarn. Like, are you, do I need to like push it in a little? Or so I, so I didn't, I didn't want to really like muck it in, but in retrospect, yeah, the ones that didn't look like they were really on there, they weren't really on there and they came off very quickly. So like, no one should be surprised here. Now we know. But I really love, I really love how the cables turned out on this. I think it's a really nice design. So I don't think that I'm going to be able to show you them on my feet if I like stand up. So we're going to, this is going to be really, really fun. What if I like, <laughs> can you see that? Does that work? Can you see feet? This is how we end up on wiki feet. I did deviate from the pattern a little. In some ways intentional, in some ways not. <laughs> Um, so let's get into it. So I was knitting this, first of all, in a thicker yarn than the pattern calls for. Um, it calls for, let me check, what does it call for? It does call for super bulky, actually. So the first time that I cast it on, I decided to just do what the pattern said and see how it turned out. I knew my yarn was probably a little bit thicker, but like the pattern said super bulky. So like, if anything, they would just end up being like a little bit bigger, which was probably good for a sort of like slouchy, comfy reading sock vibe. I thought there was a decent chance that would turn out. So I cast on 36 stitches as a pattern instructs, which gives you six um, cable repeats around the sock. Um, it <laughs> very quickly became apparent that this was going to be far, far too big. It was, it was more like a hat <laughs> in circumference than a sock. Um, so we ripped it back and I tried to cast on, I was like, okay, I need to really, really correct here. Like we need to really overcompensate because this was a big discrepancy. So um, I decided to do five repeats of the cable instead of six. So I took it down from 36 stitches to 30 stitches. Um, and I also reduced it from an eight millimeter needle to a six and a half millimeter needle. Um, so I, that was going pretty well. It seemed like the cuff was a good size. Um, then I got maybe down to like here and just with every twist of the cable, it was getting tighter and tighter <laughs> and it was getting harder and harder to work. And it got to a point where I was like, oh my God, like do I, like I physically do not have like the brute strength <laughs> to like make this happen. And like, I, I'm a tight knitter. Like I'm used to there being some tension there, but this was just like to a degree that I was like, I, like I physically, I'm not going to be able to do this. So back we ripped again. Um, and so this time I cast on third time's a charm. I cast on 30 socks, 30 socks. That would be a lot of socks. I cast on 30 stitches again. And this time I knit it on the eight millimeter needle, like the pattern recommended. And that was the golden ticket. That was our Goldilocks. It wasn't too big. It wasn't too small. And, um, that's what I knit the whole sock on. And it went pretty quickly once I had that figured out. Um, so um, yeah, in the end, I ended up doing the five repeats around the sock. So that was an intentional modification, but <laughs> because I recast this on so many times, I also had um, 
an unexpected or an unplanned modification, which I don't know if anyone else has this problem, but I have this problem where if I am going back to an element of a pattern that I have done before, if I think, you know what, I'm going to be safe and I'm going to like look it up to make sure that it's what I think it is, that I'm not missing any details. If I go back to the pattern to check, it's exactly what I thought and what a waste of time that felt like. Especially when I like want to be knitting, like the idea of like picking up my phone and looking something up feels very invasive to me. Like I don't like the like intrusion of the device in this hobby that like one of the things that's so nice about it is that it's analog. So whenever I do that, it's like, Ugh, why did I bother? I knew it, it's fine. Um, but then when I do trust myself and I do think that I remember it, <laughs> turns out I don't. So if you look at this pattern online, that it's actually a four by two rib so that this, the four stitches that make up the cable actually are four knit stitches in the rib. And then the two purl stitches in between the cables are the two purl stitches of the ribbing. So it gives you this kind of neat effect where the cable just flows into the ribbing very seamlessly in a way that mine does not because I did one by one rib because that's what <laughs> in my head it was. Um, because I kind of, I did take a couple months off of um, doing this between my various cast-ons because I would kind of started it as like an in-between project while I kind of was at an awkward point with some other projects that were like blocking and this and that. And by the time it was time to try a third cast-on for it, I had like gotten the yarn for the next big project I wanted and you know it, it just got set by the wayside and so it was um a couple months later that I pulled this out to knit um as like a Christmas knit while I was visiting family over the holidays just something I could kind of easily work at while we were sitting around hanging out and it turns out in those two months I forgot what the ribbing was supposed to look like um another modification that I made which was on purpose <laughs> was I made the um gusset and the bottom stockinette rather than reverse stockinette um that was just a personal preference um i see how like the doing it in reverse stockinette sort of ties into the space between the cables like i think that's nice um but i just prefer stockinette so i did that um and i love these i mean you can tell by how fuzzy they are so i finished these two weeks ago i've been wearing them basically non-stop um Granted, so the, the yarn is a single ply yarn and it's very thick, so it, it makes sense that it would do kind of a big fuzz. Um, so I need to give them a shave and hopefully, hopefully this is kind of its first big shed, you know, and after that it'll kind of um, calm down. But I have just been wearing these to absolute death and my feet are cold right now because I'm not wearing them. So I'm going to put them back on. Okay, editing alley here. Hi, because I just edited the part where I talked about how important financial transparency was and how I wanted to talk about the finances of my finished objects. And then came to find in my footage that nowhere did I talk about the finances of this finished object. <laughs> Great, nailing it. We're off to such a good start. So this one is an interesting um, one actually because this one actually cost me zero dollars because so as I mentioned, the, the pattern itself is free, but the yarn for this project was basically acquired for free via like a customer service mishap. <laughs> so um, I had previously purchased um, three balls of the yarn for these socks um, for a different project. I was making a scarf. Um, and I, for that scarf, I purchased three balls of this wool from We Are Knitters. And when I placed the order, I had this weird thing where like I went through checkout and it appeared to work, but then I just, I never got the order confirmation email. I was like, well, that's weird. And so I like gave it a couple days and it like showed up in my account. Like when I was logged in, it was under order history, but it was just like kind of, indefinitely pending so I gave it a few days to see if anything would change and it didn't so I contacted them and they were like oh yeah it didn't go through like just um submit submit a new order and I was like okay great and so I submitted a new order um all was fine I figured out that the problem was that I had tried to put the order on an Amex credit card and they don't take Amex but instead of telling you they don't take Amex their system is just like yeah I think that worked and then just doesn't send you a confirmation email I don't know it was all very strange but no they do not take American Express um so I placed it again with a different credit card and my order came great lovely um it seemed like it came pretty fast great pleasantly surprised and then a few days later, it came again. <laughs> it 
and I went back and checked my card statement. I only got charged once, so it was free. Um, if I had paid for it, so when I paid for it for the scarf, I bought it when it was 40% off. Um, now, because of this whole debacle, um, they had to like refund me that sale amount after because the sale was no longer happening by the time I contacted them about this. It was a whole thing. Um, but so the shipping and handling to Canada was $17 Canadian. Um, and that makes the grand total $117.50. Now, if I adjust that amount, let me calculate for the sale. So the sale price of the yarn was $60.30 plus $17 shipping. Um, so that brings it to $77 Canadian, which is it's about 57 US dollars. Um, so that's how much I spent on the yarn originally. <laughs> um, it was free the second time when I used it for these socks and for these socks I used just over two balls so I did need the third one um but I didn't use very much of the third one um so there there's the finances um and now back to past me okay so I guess now it's time to get into our whips I mean we we mostly just have one whip I'm a pretty like monogamous knitter not strictly um I'll sometimes have like a bigger thing going on and then a smaller thing just so I can kind of um have some options especially as like a bigger thing gets kind of like clunky to carry around or or if something is like complex in a way where I feel like I need to have a separate like easy knit going on okay so my main whip I will show you I have it in my little bag which <laughs> I feel like everyone on on knitting YouTube has these like beautiful project bags I'm I'm just out here using random drawstring tote bags that I get when I buy things but shout out Donna Wilson she's like a designer illustrator who um has whole like lines of products not not like not like print on demand stuff like she actually has like stuff specifically manufactured with her designs um and she has some really really beautiful stuff i bought a house coat from her that's really nice and anyway so i got this nice bag and out of it we are going to pull um the beginnings of a no frills cardigan um from petite knit so this oh we're stuck on my necklace that's fun this is a a hazard. Um, I am knitting this out of, I'll show you, a combination of knitting for olive merino, continuing the trend from the sweater I'm wearing, in the color mustard. Um, and I'm pairing it with, so this one was a bit of an adventure. So I really, I had a very specific color in my head that I wanted this cardigan to be. Um, again, remember how I mentioned that I'm picky. This, we'll see how this plays out. So I found, so Knitting for Olive has mohair that is designed to go with basically all of their merinos, but I, so I feel like this is a, a sort of like very middle of the road mustard where it's kind of halfway between like a sunny orangey yellow and like a muddy, like really brownie mustard yellow. Um, it's very sort of in the middle, but their matching mohair, matching, I'm gonna put that in quotes, matching mohair was very much on like the brownie mustard side. And I was like, I feel like when I combine those, the sweater is not gonna be the color that I want it to be. So then I started looking for other yellows and I don't know, it's really hard to find the color that I wanted this sweater to be. I found a lot of yellow that was too like sunny or even like lemony. And then I found a lot that were in the too far mustardy direction and it just it was like a quest like i had this yarn for months <laughs> before i managed to find the mohair that i wanted to pair with it but i eventually found worked out very well because we are knitters was having a sale where a few colors of their touch me mohair was like half off so this just happened to be one of them and it's perfect it's the exact color that i wanted it's this very beautiful like Still very saturated, still lots of like orangey yellowiness to it, but not not too bright, not too sunny. Like it just, it's quite a nice pairing. Like it's going to pull this just a little bit more toward a saturated yellow, which is exactly what I wanted. Now, I have to say this is like very much a misnomer. So it's called Touch Me Mohair, but if we look at the um, composition, is that the word I'm looking for? No. It is 54% baby alpaca, 22% super kid mohair, 24% mulberry silk. So like why this is marketed as a touch me mohair? I mean, I guess that that's the answer is marketing because um, it's not at all what it actually is. Um, so know that. So it definitely has a different kind of 
it's like a different fuzziness than mohair. It's kind of like, I don't know, it's almost like it has like more bulk to it, but is like, it's like bouncier. I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's just different. <laughs> and I'm curious to see how it's going to knit up. But when I did my gauge swatch, um, I, I, I started swatching this kind of right at the time that I was really like realizing that I was a tight knitter. Like I, I'd been finding a lot of my projects that I just, everything was turning out a little smaller than I thought. Um, and I, 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 I'd sort of been inconsistently swatching. And sometimes the swatch would look okay, but then the finished thing would still be weird. Or sometimes I just didn't swatch, but this was around the time that I like really figured out like oh I'm a tight knitter and because I <laughs> there were projects where I had figured this out but I didn't understand what to do about it and <laughs> um speaking of knitting being expensive um there are projects that I will talk about in my everything I've ever knit where when my gauge turned out too tight I was like well I guess I have to add more yarn like I guess I have to hold this like if it, if it was supposed to be held double, well, I guess I have to hold it triple. So let me just use 50% more yarn <laughs> than this very expensive sweater already was going to require me to use. Let, let's just add 50%. Great. Perfect. And <laughs> this was around the time that I realized, thanks to some of my beloved knitting podcasts, I don't even remember which one it was that kind of gave me this epiphany, but thank you, whoever you were, you can just go up a needle size. You don't have to use more yarn. <laughs> Who knew? Everyone but me, probably. But this was a revelation. So this pattern is supposed to be knit on, let me check. This pattern is supposed to be knit on four millimeter needles. So having figured this out about myself, I actually gauge swatched at um, a four and a half millimeter needle, which worked out perfectly. It gave me, gave me a good gauge. Um, actually, my stitch count was perfect. My row gauge was still small, a little bit, not a ton. But I figured that um, this this cardigan is a very long cardigan. Like the, well, not yet, it's not. The goal though is for this to be like almost floor length. And I'm fairly tall, like I'm 5'8". So this is going to be a very long cardigan. And I feel like just like under the weight of itself, that will probably make up for the row gauge. This is what I'm thinking. Um, and at least so far when I try it on, like I haven't been having any issues with like the shoulder area like I figured if this gauge was going to get me in trouble anywhere it was going to be at the shoulders right that like the armholes would be too small but I tried it on and that hasn't been a problem at all so I think that it's fine there I think it's going to be smooth sailing in this last words why would I say that my gauge was good but here's the thing <laughs> I gauge watched for this again a couple months before I actually started working on it do we see a pattern here why did I even swatch this so far in advance? I think it was a similar thing where I was just like at a weird point, like waiting for something to block before I could start the next thing I was actually planning to knit or something like that. Um, and so by the time I went to cast on, I could not remember which needle size I had swatched on for sure. And I thought, well, I'm pretty diligent with my Ravelry and I didn't make a note that I had swatched at a particular needle size. So surely that must mean that I just followed the pattern's recommended needle size, right? That would make sense, right? <laughs> it would make sense. It was not true. I, <laughs> um, so I don't wanna get too into the pattern because it's not a free pattern, but just very simply, you start with, with this ribbing at the neck. And when I was doing the ribbing at the neck um, on the four millimeter needle, it seemed like, it seemed like the right size. It looked right, it looked good. Um, so you kind of do a bit of that before you start any stocking it. Um, it was me, it wasn't a ton of knitting, it was maybe a couple hours of knitting, but when I started the stocking it, it very quickly became apparent that this was the wrong gauge. That in fact, I had swatched on a four and a half millimeter needle. And I had in fact just not written it down. And I had in fact screwed myself over in this way. So back we went, we started again, which was also interesting because the, the sweater just starts in a way that was <laughs> unexpected to me. Um, I mean, I, I don't have a ton of knitting experience, right? I've only been knitting for a couple of years and it was just a construction that I never encountered before. I had to learn the um, Judy's Magic Cast On. It was my first time doing that. And then it just, 
it was just just not what I expected it to be like you basically knit like here and then you knit here and then you pick up here to do your to start your stockinette and it was just strange so it was funny because the second time I did it it made a lot more sense now that I understood what was going on it, it was it. so <laughs> future back friends I really need to write down what needle size I gauge swatch at this is what I've learned um but I'm quite pleased with how this sweater is coming along I've also been knitting this on the same needles that I use for every project, which is my interchangeable needle set from Luka, I think it's pronounced L-Y-K-K-E. Um, it's this really beautiful copper set of needles that comes in this really nice um, case, and I, I just love having a set of interchangeable needles. I bought this um, pretty shortly after I started knitting. Um, it's not a cheap set, I think it was between 150 and 200 Canadian dollars, so it's pricey. Um, but I, I don't know, when I started knitting, it was very obvious to me that this was going to be um, a thing that I do a lot of for a long time. <laughs> I was under no illusion that this was going to be like a fleeting thing. Um, so I felt comfortable investing in it. And granted, I really have very little to compare them to. I really like them. I can't give you a very thorough review because the only other needles that I've knit on are just like the plastic straight needles that I got from my grandmother when she started teaching me. Um, so I don't have a lot to compare it to, but I've never had an issue with them. I really enjoy them. Um, I like having a case to keep them all together. And um, they came with different lengths of cords, which I find really helpful. Sometimes I, um, you know, will switch cord lengths during a project, especially on a raglan as things grow. Um, and I just, it's just so much easier to be able to unscrew the top of a needle rather than having to like move over stitch by stitch if you need to do that or if you want to like add in a barber cord so you can try it on more easily. I just, I just love interchangeable needles. I just can't imagine not using interchangeable needles. So I'm a big fan of those. I use them for absolutely everything. So I cast this on about two weeks ago. Um, today's a Saturday, I cast it on on a Friday. So just over two weeks. Um, and I have, I finished the raglan. I split for sleeves and I got this much of one sleeve. Um, I kind of figured I would start for sleeves both well, actually for several reasons. So one, just, just to get them over with, I feel like like sleeves are, well, normally sleeves are not my favorite part. I don't love a small circumference, but because this is a cardigan, the sleeves are knit in the round, but the body is not. And you know, like I think a lot of people, I much prefer knitting in the round. So it was kind of like, oh, I can knit in the round after doing all this knitting flat. Let's take a break from the flat knitting. So there was that. And there's also the fact that, um, I do want this to be really long. I think I have plenty of yarn, but then again, I often think that, and then I end up having to order more yarn. So my thinking is I can do the sleeves, get them to the length I want them to be, and then I can just kind of not worry about rationing my yarn, making sure I have the right amount of yarn. Like I can just knit the body until I run out of yarn or until it hits the floor, whichever comes first. Um, so um, I thought I would get that done. Um, it does mean that I have a lot of <laughs> Yarn tail is coming out of this garment right now because um, I have two balls connected to the sleeve and two balls still connected to the body, um, but it's looking pretty good. Um, and maybe I'll try it on so we can see where we're at so far. So I just tried. <laughs> to put this on and I actually cannot the way that I currently have it so I stopped for reasons unknown I stopped knitting the body like in the middle of this row so it means that like the break in my string is in the middle of the back rather than being you know at the front which would allow me to try it on um so I tried to get it on anyway it was not happening but let's see if we can like visualize we've got like we're like almost to the elbow. I mean, we'll see when I actually have it on, it might be a little different, but so we're there. We're like just at the underarm. And yeah, I feel like it's coming along pretty well. Again, it feels a little bit slow just because it is a DK weight, which I'm still kind of like getting used to knitting at. Um, so it just feels a little bit slower, but it does mean again, I think it's gonna be a much more um, wearable weight, which is gonna be really nice. Um, I kind of picture this being a sweater that I put on a lot, just like at home. Um, but then also because it's going to be so long and in this bright fun color, I feel like it's also going to be a fun like statement piece in my wardrobe. So it's just fun that I feel like it's going to do this kind of double duty in two very different areas. Um, 
So I'm hopeful about that. I'm excited. Um, so yeah, I will keep you posted on how this one comes along. My second whip is, I mean, a large stretch to call it a whip, but <laughs> here's my whip. It is a gauge swatch, <laughs> but good for me for making a gauge swatch, right? So um, this one is kind of a mystery. So here's what's happening. <laughs> I started watching Sarah Lily Makes here on YouTube and she uses a lot of like hand dyed variegated colorful yarns and I have always been under the impression that those just aren't my thing, they're just not for me, they're not my style. But something about the things that she knit, the particular hand dyed yarns that she used, it was the first time that I was like, oh, like maybe I do like that kind of yarn. Maybe. Maybe it's just a very particular kind of it that I like, but she was using some of those particular kinds. Like what I sort of learned from looking at some of her projects is that I like variegation where it's more variegation of hue than of tone, like rather than like contrast of like lights and darks, um, even if that's different colors, you know, like a light blue and like a dark pink, like I would still call that a, a variation of tone. A lot of hers were very similar in tone, like if you put them black and white, it would kind of look like all one color, but the hue was different. You know, it might be like yellow and pink and blue, um, just all of a sort of like similar lightness. And I found, I was really surprised by how much I liked that. Um, and the ones that she was showing were all from Hedgehog Fibers, which she was the one who introduced me to Hedgehog Fibers. And what an expensive introduction that was. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've, I've been tempering it. I have only purchased one skein, but like, let's be real, it's an expensive skein. Um, and of course it is, because a lot of manual labor goes into making this. And I, I've since learned, um, I think Hedgehog Fibers is really known for really well done color variegation, where things are very even and very well spread out in the yarn. So you don't really have the issues of pooling and other things like this that can be issues with hand dyed yarns. Um, so, it makes sense that it's expensive, of course it is. Um, but it just means that like, it's something to think about when I'm like deciding on what garment I wanna knit and what I wanna knit it out of. So I just was pouring over the Hedgehog Fibers website for days. Like I'm like supposed to be working and like, oh, somehow I'm suddenly on the Hedgehog Fibers website and I'm like <laughs> narrowing it down like, man, I love this colorway and this colorway and this colorway. Um, and the one that I finally landed on is this one, which is the color Budgie, which actually breaks a little bit the rule that I was talking about with like the lights and darks, because it is largely similar in tone. Like there are these purples and greens and blues that are all very light, but then there are these black speckles, um, which, you know, time will tell if I regret that or not. I was just so in love with the variegation between the other colors in it that I thought I'm willing to take a risk on the black flex because I just love the rest of it so much, but it's kind of left me with this debacle of what I knit with it. So like for one thing, I only bought one skein again, because it is very expensive yarn and I'm not hundred percent sure whether I'm going to love it as a garment. I know that I love it as a skein. Like I, I've already wound it into a ball, but it came in such a beautiful hank. Like I was just like staring at it like, like it's just like choirs of angels sing like it's just so beautiful when it's still just like in a skein but I just don't know if I'm gonna feel that way as a garment so I thought okay we'll just get one skein we'll find a single skein project to make with it um and we'll see how we feel and we'll go from there but I have not figured out what project that's going to be in part because I feel like there's a lot of options, but I'm not totally sold on any of them. So one of the other options, and actually what I first thought that I would do is actually use this in a color work project where um, this was like the accent color so that it wasn't the one like touching my skin because part of my consideration with this also part of, I think the reason that I don't tend to like variegated yarns or the, the ones that are in colorways that I like for their own sake, like these like bright light colors kind of all mixed together. I don't tend to love how those look on me. So the ones that I like, I don't like on me. The ones that I would feel look good on me, I don't really like for their own sake, you know, sort of this conflict. 
So it's like, well, what if I use this in a color work where it's not the color that's like next to skin, right? Like if it was say like a raglan where like the neckline is like a neutral color or just like a darker color or a richer color or like, you know, maybe it's like the slightly darker blue in there. Just something that I feel looks better on me. And then this is sort of like somewhere in the design. Um, so I, I poured over color work patterns, but then I found that, I don't know, weirdly a lot of color work has the accent color around your neck or I mean there's also the problem that I don't think I can use it in stranded color work because even though you can't see it everywhere with all the floats like the floats are still using a lot of the yarn so I wasn't sure that I would um be able to have enough of it and then there's also like because there's the dark flecks if I used it as the contrast color against like a like a charcoal gray sweater or something say like would the motif get kind of messed up by the black flecks that then kind of like blend into the main color too much like if they happen to land at an edge or something I don't know I'm just <laughs> I'm just not sure and so then I was looking at you know like summery garments like tank tops but then I a lot of the summer tops that I like the most are kind of all over ribbing and I don't feel like all over ribbing is my favorite look in a variegated yarn. I feel like I like how it looks best in plain stockinette. But then like the few plain stockinette summary tops that I found that I liked, I'm not sure I like how I would imagine this looks in them. So I'm just like, I just am struggling to figure out the perfect thing to make with it. And my most recent thought, so I found a pattern called the Funfetti Raglan by Andrea Gon, Goffin, Goggin? Gochen. Or Andrea Gowen called the Funfetti Raglan and basically what it would be is the main color of the sweater would be maybe a cream or maybe maybe a, a light gray or something and then the little tiny color work flecks would be from this yarn and so the way that I imagine it would work is just the kind of every little V would be a different like random color from this and I think that that might be a really fun way to use a variegated yarn but it also might feel like it's not giving what a variegated yarn is supposed to give I don't know I don't know so my thought is my thought is I might do a swatch for that pattern with that color work to see if I like the look of it like it is a color work sweater but the accent color only comes in once every so many rows so you really don't use very much of it in the pattern at all. Like I would definitely have enough with my skein of this. Um, so I'm thinking that might be what I try with this. I don't know. I still don't know. Let me know if you have suggestions of what you would do with this yarn. Because I absolutely love it. And I feel like I'm being, <laughs> I'm being precious about it. Like I'm afraid of turning it into a garment that I end up not liking or not wearing very often. This is also part of the problem is I found some garments that I think it would look cute in, but they are not garments that I think I would get a lot of wear out of, which I also don't really want to do. So, help. Okay, so that is the end of a knitting podcast, I guess. I, I don't have any acquisitions. I mean, this would be the closest thing to an acquisition and I bought this months ago. <laughs> so we don't have any acquisitions. Um, yeah, so if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for giving my little thumbnail a chance by clicking on it. Um, and I, I do think that in this podcast, I would also, I would like to add a segment at the end that's like non-knitting creative stuff I'm doing. And I want to keep it at the end because I know a lot of people, like you just want to see the knitting content and like I totally get that. That's totally fine. So if this is where I leave you, amazing. Thank you so much for being here. So I hope to see you here soon. Um, please do subscribe if you think you might want to see more. My next video, like I said, is going to be my everything I've ever knit. So I feel like that's, that's a good video. You know, the like everything I knit in whatever year, that's always a good video. Everything I ever knit, I think that's even better. So I'm excited for that one. So please do subscribe. Please do stick around. I hope to see you next time. Bye. All right. So first of all, if you're still here, know that you're my favorite. Um, second, so I, I really love to read. Um, so let's, let's like knitting podcast format our reading, shall we? Let's do a finished, a finished book to start with. So I most recently read, um, Stay Gold by Toby McSmith. So this is a YA contemporary novel. I love YA contemporary. It's one of my favorite genres. 
Um, and this one is about a teenager named Pony who is a trans boy who's starting over at a new school um, and his goal is basically to be stealth here for no one to know that he's trans. Um, and this gets very complicated when he kind of falls for a very popular cheerleader who is not at all low profile. So I really enjoyed this book. It took me a little bit to get into it, in part because of the same things that I ultimately loved it for. <laughs> so I, I really loved the voices of the characters. Like they were just like so fun and like vibrant and like just like alive and funny. The part of the issue I had early on was that for one of the two narrating characters, the cheerleader, Georgia, her voice uses a lot of slang, but part of, part of the issue is that slang moves quickly and publishing does not. And this book, I think, I think this came out in 2020, so already I'm reading it a few years late. Books take a year or two to be published after they've been purchased by a publisher, books take at least a year in most cases to write and revise. So like by the time I was reading this at the end of 2023, like it had probably been written in like 2016, 2017, like had, had probably been last revised in like 2019 before it hit the press. So like the slang moves, right? <laughs> so there were some moments early on in the book that I just like found like a little bit just like uh, like it just it just grated in this way of like I see the kind of humor that you're trying to use here but it's just like it's already dated it already feels a little bit like squeaky um but I I found that less and less as the book went on so I don't know if it was just a couple particular instances or if I just got used to it but it really wasn't an issue after that um and I came to really really love the voices so I I really enjoyed this book. I do recommend. I would say the the end went much darker, much faster than I expected it to. And like, of course, like you can very easily see how this book could deal with some really heavy subjects. And most of the book does so, but in a fairly like lighthearted way. And in the end, it's kind of very suddenly like much more um, graphic than I expected it to be in some of those things. So I would just say that like, if you're a person who might want to heed a trigger warning. I'm not going to say what the trigger warning is because it is kind of a plot spoiler, but just I would look into it if you think that might be an issue for you, but I would recommend. And as far as reading whips, I'm currently reading The Black Kids by Christina Hammonds Reed, and I'm only about 80 pages in so far, so I'm still very much in like the setup phases, but the setup of this book is so good. I'll give you the premise. So this book is about a teen girl named Ashley. Um, we are again in I was going to say YA contemporary. It's not YA contemporary. It's YA historical because it's set in the 90s, which <laughs> to think of that as being historical is a little bit upsetting, but here we are. Um, so it's about a girl named Ashley who's a teenager in LA and the LA riots break out. So the setup of the novel is kind of in the phase where the trial is ongoing, but there hasn't been a verdict yet. And I'm kind of at the cusp of like when the verdict is about to come out. So I think the story is really about to kick into another gear. Is it a higher gear? Is it a lower gear? I don't know how to drive standard. I'm sorry. Ashley is one of like the only black kids at her school. She goes to this private school in this very white, very affluent area. Um, and all of her friends are white. And basically where it seems like it's going is that when the riots break out, it's really going to bring to the surface a lot of underlying tensions that have been there um, with her and her friends. Just the setup so far is just so good. Like just the way that Hammond's Reed is really like showing the world that Ashley is living in. Like it feels weird to refer to it as world building. Like this is not high fantasy. She's just really like showing what it's like to be this girl in this particular kind of neighborhood in this particular sort of like lazy, hazy days of summer time of year. And I really feel like I am like in the place that they are in when I'm reading this book. But yeah, so I'm really enjoying this one so far as well. Recommend. One of the other things that I really love to do and that's really important to me is writing. Um, and part of the reason that I read a lot of YA contemporary is also because that's what I like to write. Um, I mean, is that why? Do I like to write YA contemporary because I like to read? This is very chicken and the egg, but <laughs> it's a genre that I write in. So um, I, while I do also enjoy some other categories of reading, I do feel like it's important for me to prioritize reading YA contemporary because I need to know what's going on in that area. Like I, 
I would love to publish a book one day. That is like a personal goal that I am in pursuit of. So I need to kind of know what's going on. So right now I'm in kind of the end stages of what I'm going to call my like second manuscript. This isn't like, <laughs> this isn't strictly true. Like I've done NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month um, for years. So if you don't know what National Novel Writing Month, the premise is that in the month of November every year you write a 50,000 word draft of a novel. Um, and I did that every year from eighth grade through the end of university. And of course, when you draft a novel in that amount of time, like that's, that's not a finished book, right? Like <laughs> even when you don't race through a draft of a novel in a month, there's still a lot of revision that is required, many rounds of it usually. Um, and a travel that you, a travel, a novel that you drafted in 30 days is going to be even more so. Um, but I was never writing those with the intent of publication. I was just doing that as like, an exercise in writing. I knew that I loved writing. I knew it was important to me, but also, you know, I was busy with school and whatever. And it was just helpful for me to have November as like, this is the time of year that I focus on writing. And it was just a way to keep doing that and to practice that and to hone that skill. So I wrote all of these drafts, um, most of which were, I mean, complete manuscripts in that it was a complete story. But for reference, 50,000 words is quite a short book. Um, the Catcher in the Rye is about 50,000 words it's quite a short novel. So most books you would read would be longer than that, but they they all basically were complete manuscripts, but I never went back and edited them. So they were complete first drafts. They were not complete books. <laughs> so when I say that I'm in the end stages of my second manuscript, I mean my second one that I have like seriously worked on, revised with the intention of trying to publish it. So um, my first one I wrote in 2019, spent that year writing, revising, um, and then in 2020, just as the pandemic was hitting, I was working on querying that book, which is the process of like writing this very specifically formatted letter that you're using to pitch it to an agent in hopes that you will get an agent to sign you and then that agent will help you try to sell that book to a publisher. Um, so it's this very complicated process with like a lot more to it then is immediately apparent there's a lot of research to do there's a lot of editing this query letter and trying to get it to like be exactly what it needs to be and pitch the book and exactly the right like it's just it's just a world unto itself um and then typically when you're querying you're submitting that query letter along with the first either five or ten pages of your book so there's also a lot of like really trying to hone those first five to ten pages to make sure that within that short snippet you're really getting in all the important things that the agent kind of needs to be able to read up front to like have enough to get some investment in the story or have some idea of what's going on. Like you really, you can't have like a meandery first five pages. Um, so a lot goes into trying to hone that too. Together, the letter and the pages are called your submission package. So just a lot of time spent on your submission package. So I did all that. I um, did a lot of querying um, in the year of 2020 and I got a few, I think three full requests, meaning that the agent says like, oh, like I like the sound of this. Could I read the manuscript? So I think I got three of those, um, which I mean, is better than zero. Also not a great ratio. I think I sent out about 60 queries in total, like over the course of the year. Um, so encouraging that I got a few bites, but none of them ultimately went anywhere. So while I was sort of waiting to hear back, um, because querying is mostly waiting, <laughs> um, while I was waiting, I started drafting my next manuscript, which is the one that I'm in the end stages of now. So um, I drafted it in 2020, and then it really kind of got backburnered more recently. So I, I drafted it, I did several rounds of revision, so it was in like a fairly close to done point, but then I I really kind of set it aside um, just with like other kind of big life stuff that was going on over the last year or two. Um, and I've gotten back into it more recently. And um, so I'm now kind of in the process of like revisiting my submission package. I, I had actually sent out at the end of 2022, I sent out my first round of queries. So I sent out about 10 queries and didn't get any bites on that one. So I'm like, okay, I, I have the benefit of some distance now. So I'm revising my submission package again. I'm reworking my query letter. I'm reworking my first 10 pages. So that's what I'm working on right now. And um, I'm looking forward to um, this coming week. I'm participating in like a submission package workshop thing. Um, it's like an online event over the course of a few days where there's different online 
like talks about improving your submission package and your querying process and all this and also some like forum interaction some critiques stuff like that so looking forward to that hoping to um be in a position to start round two of querying this book <laughs> a year later um but yeah i'm hoping to get that out into the world into agents inboxes um within the next month or two hopefully um and then i can move on to drafting my next manuscript because it is always a good idea to be working on your new manuscript while you're querying because like even if a book gets published it's after you've gotten a lot of rejections and i think that the best way to sort of inoculate yourself against those rejection emails is to have already disconnected yourself from that book by working on your next one right so you already feel like it's old news so i've sort of done some brainstorming around my new one but it's not, I need to plan things. Here, here's the problem. I'm bad at writing plot. I love characters. I could write a whole book where nothing happens <laughs> and um, nobody wants to buy that book. So it means that it's really important for me to outline so that there is a plot in the book. So that also means that the kind of upfront work of a book before I start actually drafting is really hard. Like the first step of writing this book is outlining a plot. I'm like, I'm not good at plot. That's why I write books that are all characters. So I'm kind of, I, I have like a loose outline done and I got, I think I got sort of like three quarters of the way through a much more in-depth outline. Um, and then I kind of got stuck on like, okay, I'm not actually sure how to flesh out that part of it yet. So um, that was kind of around the time that I decided like, okay, let's pull back out manuscript two. Let's work on honing that submission package a little. And then once that's on its way, then we'll come back to manuscript three and really finish outlining this and start drafting. So I've sort of got fingers in like both manuscript two and manuscript three right now, um, but I'm hoping to wrap up one so I can move on to the other in the near future. So I think that's all I really have to tell you about today of my non-knitting stuff. I mean, there are other things that I do, but I'll talk to you about those as I kind of have updates about them. If you stuck around to the very end, thank you. You clicked on a knitting podcast and then you proceeded to hear me talk for I don't know, what, 15 minutes about stuff that's not even knitting? That's so nice of you. Thank you. I hope to see you next time. Bye.